Let me ask one question because I know this, I was, I was actually surprised to hear this the other day. I was at a meeting with a number of very well-respected medical oncologists and we were discussing actually cabazitaxel or Geftana, which as we know is approved only in patients who have already received docetaxel chemotherapy. And I was actually uh, rather surprised that a number of medical oncologists, if it was approved in the pre-chemo, pre-docetaxel space, they feel it actually might be a little bit better tolerated than traditional docetaxel. Absolutely. Yeah, no doubt. I think, mo I mean, I think the biggest challenges that patients on docetaxel face is neuropathy, asthenia, right? And when you look, for instance, at cabazitaxel outside the need for growth factor support because of the incidence of uh, grade three and four neutropenia, you know, it's an agent that actually really doesn't lead to neuropathy, right? And it, I mean, overall, you know, I think cabazitaxel is a far better agent than docetaxel with regards to side effect profile. Hmm. You know, now if you look at, for instance, the tropic data and look at, at uh, PSA response, you know, objective response, you know, those numbers mathematically, they, they don't look that different from what we saw with tax three to seven right so I mean we'll see that it's an ongoing trial you know uh, comparing head-to-head -head, you know uh, docetaxel and cabazitaxel in fact it is a superiority trial design that will define whether or not cabazitaxel actually will be superior to docetaxel in that CRPC haven't they setting. shown that in some you know uh, in vitro studies where it had the pump mechanism yep. the ATPase yep, pump is less effective uh, with Cabazitaxel. Correct. If you have a young, let's say you have a young patient with M1 hormone naive prostate cancer uh, who gets referred, who starts docetaxel, and let's say he has some neuropathy after cycle two or three, can you switch to cabazitaxel to get those six cycles in? I know it's off label, but is that is that something that I is would being say done? that I, I would be totally confident that there's going to be less neuropathy with Correct. the cabazitaxel okay. in that setting. Okay. And the other thing that's interesting is neuropathy is less of a problem in prostate cancer, I think, than impressive. it is in others. And that's because we have so much experience with CRPC, and I think that's because we're giving it with prednisone, mm. uh, the chemotherapy that is. Right. We haven't talked about it, but it's another discussion, which is the giving chemotherapy in the castration-sensitive setting is different. Right. It's a different biology. Right, and I think people need to understand that. You know, we're having a discussion on chartered in stampede, which is again that hormone naive patient. The discussion, as you appropriately said, Chuck, is that in the CRPC patient, that is a completely different patient. We've already altered the microtumor environment. But again, correct me, there is a study currently that's in the MCRPC space looking head to head docetaxel. Yep versus cabazitaxel. Yes, that was a post-marketing commitment that, uh, that the group from, uh, uh, from cabazitaxel had with the FDA. So there are two, in fact, there are two trials. One is the superiority trial against docetaxel, and the other one is looking at a lower dose of cabazitaxel uh, from the previous experience with the phase one, two data. But if I may, just, I just want to go back into your, uh, your point about uh, the primary uh, tumor, you know, and the importance of management of the primary uh, tumor. I think is pivotal in the management of prostate cancer patients, where you have advanced disease or not, oftentimes when you become castration resistant, and if you haven't addressed the primary, you know, oftentimes these patients will go out, develop hematuria, progression in their bladder, hydronephrosis. So I, I'm a pretty uh, aggressive guy telling my, uh, my, my younger patients for that matter that if you need ADT and chemo, we'll do it, but at some given time, we're gonna have to address the primary. Yeah. As now, I like to put it, patients who develop CRPC who have an intact primary have a a much more miserable Absolutely. time it, when they have complications there. Let me just bring a point up for the urologist. I was at an international meeting, or the SIU Congress was just recently held, and uh, Laurie Klotz, who obviously has done a lot of work in, in uh, active surveillance and various things, presented a masterful talk, again, speaking as a surgeon, looking at a meta-analysis suggesting that radical prostatectomy really has a benefit over radiotherapy right. In, in, uh, in treating localized disease. Now I know that's gonna be a politically incorrect statement to say as a surgeon, the radiation oncologist, but this was really compelling data looking at uh, some very large series where uh, now the radiation oncologist is gonna say not randomized, but really robust, huge data sets. And Mike, I know you guys have published a paper recently uh, or <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> about about the use of of aggressive therapy, 
And again, I've been I've been a big believer in that just because I, you know, like you said, it's the control of local disease. Right. And when you and when you miss that opportunity to to take care of the primary, you you wish you could go back. Yeah, absolutely. And that. So this has been a great discussion. I think we've reviewed several important studies in prostate cancer and have discussed a lot in terms of treatment for obviously castration resistant prostate cancer as well as early localized and advanced disease. So before we end today's discussion, I'd like to sort of get some final thoughts from all the panelists, almost some take home points, what you uh, as an individual would like to convey to our audience. So Mike. Well, I think first, like we said earlier, we wouldn't be having this conversation eight, 10 years ago. Uh, I think it's exciting that we have a lot of options for our patients now. I think the key is to uh, treat these patients earlier, recognize advanced disease earlier, uh, and I think that is the take home message. Chuck? Uh, practice proactive medicine, not reactive medicine, I think is the key point. Uh, and uh, stay attuned to the evolving knowledge of biology here because it's moving fast. There are new molecular markers and pathways coming that will be important. All right. Uh, I think defining, you know, your goals of treatment for that patient that you have in front of you is pivotal when you're making treatment decisions in a crowded market with many great agents without really knowing which is the best agent for that particular patient. And lastly, I think that uh, chemotherapy is, in fact, the new standard of care for men with castration-sensitive disease, with metastatic disease. Okay. Jed? And I would say, again, now more than ever, the team approach for CRPC and also hormone-naive metastatic disease because urologists and medical oncologists really need to partner for these patients for the best care. Both, both specialties clearly manage these patients and need to continue to be on the forefront, but team medicine. Okay. Yeah. Great. So on behalf of our panel, we thank you for joining us and look forward to seeing you next time.